Da, vrlo mi je žao da nisam imao vremena da bi to pripremio na srpskom, barem neki slovenački varijanti srpskog, ali za sljedeći put možda. A, htio bih samo da na početku kažem kako mi je prijetno ovdje, kako se mi čini to vrlo važan i pomenuvam posao što radi naše drugarice i drugovi iz, iz Belgrada i da je to početak neš, nečekog velikog. A, Dobro. Uh, basics of Marxism through the reading of Communist Manifesto. Our friends have asked me to give a lecture on the basics of Marxist theory. This is no small task and I can only hope to do at least some justice to an extremely rich intellectual and political tradition that was inspired by Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. This tradition is in fact so wealthy and complex that one immediately needs to ask oneself, which Marxism are we actually talking about? because there are indeed many. Are we talking about Marxism of Rosa Luxemburg that inspired left communist current, or are we talking about Marxism as it was developed in the circles of the Second International by the authors like Karl Kautsky and August Bebel? Perhaps we are talking about revisionist Marxism inspired by Edward Bernstein, who believed that we can achieve socialism through reforming capitalism and that revolution is not necessary. Or maybe we're talking about structural Marxism as developed in France by the likes of Louis Althusser and Nicolas Polanzas, who focused on the analysis of the state and state apparatuses. Let us not forget the Frankfurt School and the Leninist, Maoist, and Trotskyist interpretations of Marxism, and of course, Praxis School that was developed in the former Yugoslavia. If we wanted to do justice to all these complex currents of classical and contemporary Marxism, we would have to devote an entire lecture to this question, and even that wouldn't be enough. We would have to devote a whole series of lectures to just get a glimpse of extreme variety and complexity of various theoretical schools and political implications of Marxism. However, our aim is not to do that. As the title of the lecture already suggests, we will try to conquer fundamentals of Marxist theory through reading of one of its most important documents, Communist Manifesto. This short pamphlet is one of the most widely read documents in the history of mankind, and being familiar with it is even considered a matter of good taste. Even some liberal economists admit its analysis is still as powerful and penetrating as it was when it was written in 1848. It goes without saying that Manifesto is not purely a theoretical and analytical document, it is, after all, a manifesto of the Communist Party, and as such includes very concrete political critique and proposals. Another argument for reaching the basics of Marxism through a reading of this document is the fact that Marx and Engels never revised it and always maintained that its basic analysis holds relevance. It also seems only correct and fair to learn about the basics of Marxism from the origin, that is, from Marx himself, because being well-trained in Marx's own theory equips us with the best knowledge to critically deal with all different types of Marxism that have later on developed and of which we have already mentioned a few. Our reading of the Manifesto won't be dealing so much with the historical circumstances of its creation. It goes without saying that we, all, we are all very much determined by the times we are living in. Indeed, some critics believe Manifesto is nothing more than that a document of the social situation as it existed in the middle of 19th century, especially in England, and is now by far gone. Such interpretations are derived from a belief that Marx and Engels had something interesting, some interesting observations about the times they were living in, but since we are living in a radically different time, the manifesto is not re really relevant anymore. At best, <clears throat> it is an interesting historical curiosity. Authors that present such critique usually believe that capitalism of Victorian era, so vividly described in the novels of Charles Dickens, was very much regrettable, but does not exist anymore. Bottom line is that manifesto as such cannot tell us anything about the world around us, the world we are currently living in. Basically, such critique, critics argue that capitalism of Marx's time was fundamentally different from the one we are living in. Of course, our position is completely opposed. We definitely believe that Manifesto can tell us very much and can offer a very good understanding of the world we are living in, which I believe was very obvious from the lectures we've been hearing in the last two, three days. Although capitalism has indeed changed very much, it still remains capitalism, 
it still functions according to its basic laws, of which we have really we have heard a lot. The law of value, the iron law of competition, uh, the tendential law of profit rate to fall, such laws. These laws were thoroughly exposed through the analysis that Marx provides. Because of that, I believe Manifesto presents a very good entry point for getting familiar with Marx's theory as such. Many of its central concepts are already present in this pamphlet, at least in their embryonic form. Our ambition with reading Communist Manifesto will, be, will therefore be fourfold. First, first of all, we will try to carefully examine all of the fundamental concepts, or at least the most important concepts, of Marxist theory that appear in the Manifesto. Secondly, we will update these concepts with concrete examples from the contemporary capitalism and emphasize their continuing relevance. Thirdly, we will try to present a case why these concepts are more powerful of a tool for understanding the processes of global capitalism than some other theoretical approaches. And finally, we will point out that most of the concepts we will encounter and talk about were further developed and refined in the works of mature Marx. That is through the project known under the name of Critique of Political Economy that culminated in three volumes of Capital. Lecture will consist of five thematic chapters. In the first, we will address the specter of communism. We will then continue with the concept of class struggle. Further, further on will be world market. Uh, the fourth issue will be crisis of capitalism. And, and we will finish with the chapter on false and real alternatives to, to capitalism. Without further ado, let us now begin our journey through the land of communist manifesto. The document begins with the famous proclamation that there is a spect the specter is haunting Europe, a specter of communism. All of the reactionary forces, the Tsar, the Pope, French radicals and German policemen are united in an attempt to exercise this dangerous specter that could disturb the old order. The order of European monarchs supported by the religious authorities. The first paragraph of this short foreword that introduces us into the Communist Manifesto already shows some interesting things that are worth emphasizing. First of all, the prose. It is no coincidence that Marx and Engels use the phrase specter of communism. Indeed, a devoted reader of their works will later on encounter similar wealth of metaphors. Capital is exploiting and sucking the life of workers like a vampire. Capitalists are driven by a werewolf hunger for surplus labor. Not just men, but women and children are driven beneath the wheels of juggernaut of capital. Modern bourgeois society is like a sorcerer who is no longer able to control the powers of the netherworld whom he has called up by his spells. The list could go on and on, and just shows Marx and Engels definitely were one of those classical intellectuals that were intimately familiar with languages, culture, arts, political economy, philosophy, science, etc. Indeed, nowadays, there are various schools of Marxism that specialize for different aspects of Marx's theory. Some authors deal with literary dimension of Marx's work. We can use his insights for legal, legal or cultural studies, for a language analysis, or analysis of capitalism as such. Indeed, the latter was actually Marx's life project, and I would argue all other dimensions of his work, powerful as they are, remain in the service of making his analysis of capitalism more understandable and accessible. Marx is therefore not using literary, historical, cultural, and all other kinds of metaphors, analogies, and illustrations to seem smart and to impress the reader, but they serve as a very concrete, but they serve a very concrete purpose of, defeat, of depicting capitalism in all its complexity. As he writes in the last section of the first chapter of Capital, where he deals with the fetishism of commodities, in order to really understand capitalism, especially its most fundamental element, commodity form, I quote, we must have recourse to the mist enveloped regions of the religious world. The world we are living in, the world of capitalism, appears to us so foreign, so alien, so detached from anything rational, that we have to use religious metaphors to explain it to make some sense out of it. We will return to the point of just how irrational of a system capitalism actually is later on. At this point, we want to emphasize how wealthy Marx's thought and analysis actually is, 
and how far away it is from common criticism that accuses it of economic determinism. Actually, and to be precise, it is not Marxism or Marx himself that suffers from economic determinism. It is capitalism itself that does. But again, this is a point we will return to. What we try to show is that not only Marxism, as it developed later on, but also the very thought of Karl Marx himself is complex because we cannot say it is only an economic or only a political or only a philosophical thought. On every step of the way, it is all of the above and so much more than that. It is, an import it is important to, to keep in mind to keep this in mind, because social sciences, as they developed in the 20th century, specialized on a couple of issues, while losing the broader systemic perspective that is one of the most distinctive qualities of Marxism. In the jargon of today's social sciences, we could say Marx's thought was profoundly interdisciplinary, although it developed in a time when, strictly speaking, disciplines as we know them today didn't even exist. Coming to the second important point that is present in the foreword of Communist Manifesto, we can notice the sentence, it is high time that communists openly in the face of the whole world publish their views, their aims, their tendencies, and meet this nursery tale of the specter of communism with the manifesto of the party itself. Why is this proclamation so important? Because other socialists of the time, for example, Louis Blanqui, had completely different ideas how to implement socialism. Blanqui, for example, believed that the revolution should not be carried by the working class, but by a small conspirational group that would establish temporary dictatorship by force. Later on, they would hand the power to the people. On the contrary, Marx and Engels believed that the revolution should be the work of the working class itself. They were firmly against all attempts of achieving socialism through conspiracy. Manifesto is therefore consciously a public document, published, if we repeat, in the face of the whole world. If we try to summarize, in Marx's own time, as in ours, communism was perceived as a kind of evil spirit, something extremely dangerous to the healthy spirit of capitalism. This much we can agree on. Communism definitely is the arch enemy of capitalism. However, it is only through communism that a rational social organization and production can be achieved. And Communist Manifesto is a document that aims to explicate the rationality of communism versus the irrationality of capitalism. Let us now proceed to the first chapter, Bourgeois and Proletarians. Again, the section begins with another famous sentence. The history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggle. Immediately, we are faced with one of the most important concepts of Marxism, the concept of class struggle. It is not only capitalism that suffers from class struggle, but so do all other social systems, more precisely production systems, that have existed before capitalism. To be even more precise, class struggle begins to exist only with written history. Beforehand, in the so-called prehistory of mankind, land was mostly communal. That is why Marx and Engels characterized this first stage of human development as the stage of primitive communism. However, in a slave ownership society whose production is based on slave work, class struggle between free men and slave already existed. A concrete manifestation of such struggle were the uprisings in Roman Empire, organized under the leadership of former slave gladiator Spartacus. Marx actually admired Spartacus very much and described him as the most splendid fellow in the whole of ancient history, and a great general, noble character, and a real representative of the ancient proletariat. Class struggle continued through the next stage of human development, feudalism, where feudal lords and peasants were the two opposing classes, until finally we enter a society we are currently living in, capitalism. Society where class struggle is fought between capitalists, or the bourgeois, that is owners of capital, and the working class, or proletarians, who, who, who own nothing but their labor power. As we will see in a short while, this contradiction, that is an integral element of capitalism, which means capitalism cannot exist without it, becomes most visible and violent in the time of crisis. For the moment, suffice it to say that Warren Buffett, one of the wealthiest people in the world, at a certain point proclaimed. There's a class warfare, all right, 
but it's my class, the rich class, that's making war and we're winning. Since class analysis and class struggle are so central to Marxism, are its distinctive quality, let us devote a bit more time to this very important issue. A student of sociology will learn that there are various approaches, various different ways of trying to understand the society we're living in. Marxism, known also as historical materialism, is specific and distinctive in various aspects. First of all, it is not a theory valid for all times. Although Marx and Engels are very explicit that class struggle is an integral part of all former societies, we have to pay attention to two important elements. Class struggle is different in each historical epoch, and Marxism deals almost exclusively with society we are currently living in. Marx had a very clear idea what would have to happen, that a society would cease to be capitalist, that classes would stop to exist. Only when production would cease to be driven by the profit motive, and when social needs will become the drive of the economic system, can we, according to Marx, talk about the post-capitalist society. This much is clear. However, Marx never prescribed any kind of recipes where he would try to imagine how exactly would such a society look like. On the contrary, he was very skeptical towards any such efforts and criticized utopian socialists for trying to imagine future in every detail. As he wrote in the afterword to second German edition of Capital, I confine myself to, to mere critical observation, uh, mere critical analysis of fact, actual facts, instead of writing recipes for the cook shops of the future. Marx was well aware that society of the future, a classless society, a communist society, will be the work of the future generations, of the people who will build it themselves. It is important to keep in mind that this society, which Marx defined as the end of prehistory of human development, is not defined statically. Communism is not a state of affairs. It is not an ideal toward which, towards which reality itself would have to adjust. But it is precisely the opposite. It is, I quote, real movement which abolishes the present state of things. The conditions of this movement result from the premises now in existence. And even before writing the Communist Manifesto, Marx already wrote that communism is the real deal of history solved, and it knows itself to be the solution. So communism is both an end of extremely long prehistory of mankind, history of continuous exploitation and class struggles, while also being a beginning of the new history where contradictions of a class society will be abolished and mankind will be finally able to consciously and rationally use all of its creative potentials and forces. Communism is not the end of human history. It is its genuine beginning. We have, to, we have tried to underline that Marxism is a historically specific theory and in the bright future when capitalism will be abolished, Marxism, as such, won't have much relevance either. It will necessarily become nothing but a historical curiosity, theory that spoke about times that are gone. Its success is the condition of its demise. But since we are still living in these times, it is still very much productive and useful to use Marxism as an analytical tool to best understand our social reality. Let us further elaborate the specificity of class approach. In trying to understand society, there are a number of ways we can try to grasp it. We could say that society is primarily determined by the conflict between hard-working people and lazy people. We could say that the best way to understand society is through differences between different races, or maybe different identity groups, perhaps different religious groups. There are indeed so many ways of drawing a line through a society and then trying to articulate it as the only rational way of understanding society, that it is impossible to make a list of them all. Usually, we have a combination of many different elements. For example, a ghetto in a certain city is predominantly explained as problematic because lazy immigrants with different culture and religion are living there and are not willing to assimilate. Instead of becoming hardworking people like the rest of the population, they resort to petty crime and social benefits. Although this is a completely abstract example, one could quickly find concrete, concrete examples for it, either here in Belgrade, in Ljubljana, London, or any other modern city for that matter. 
This is best defined as the ideology of the ruling class, one systematically or spontaneously adopted by the media and common people. It is a way of understanding and articulating social conflicts that exist in a society while also prescribing remedies for its solution. If the main problem of immigrants is their laziness and not being willing to assimilate, this already has clear implications. It's a specific psychological, moral if you want, ethical problem of their ethnic group and it is their responsibility to adapt. Instead of trying to understand broader and systemically determined social circumstances, such analysis blames the victim and it demands that it adjusts to the oppressor. Because, curiously, although immigrants are by their definition a minority in every society, in nationalist ideology they usually pose an extreme threat towards the majority. Although this majority controls all the power in its hands, various state apparatuses, system of education, police, media, etc., it is somehow immigrants that pose the most dangerous threat to the equilibrium of the society. The most extreme example of such, such ideology is of course Nazism in the Third Reich, which nowadays again has a lot of admirers, for example members of the Greek Golden Dawn Party. Common denominator of all such an social analysis is that they always remain on the surface and are not willing, more precisely, do not have the interest to go deeper and really understand what is at the core of the social issues. Instead of addressing central problems, that cause segregation, poverty, social exclusion, petty crime, they, all, they only condemn their results without understanding their preconditions. Class analysis, on the other hand, offers a much more pof powerful, profound and trustworthy methodology of explaining social reality. Through class analysis, we can quickly realize that we are living in a society of haves and have-nots. Those that have are becoming richer every day, those that don't have are poorer with each, each passing day. Social movements of recent years, for example Occupy Wall Street, have talked about the conflict between the 1% and the rest, the 99% of us. Indeed, social inequality has reached such amazing proportions that it is difficult to find an analogy in the history of mankind. The problem with Occupy movement was that it articulated this inequality predominantly in moral and ethical terms. At the end of the day, they believed more integrity and ethical be behavior on behalf of ruling class would solve the problem. But what can the ruling class actually do? Well, they can do a lot. They can suspend democratic rights, rights. they can force, as was so often the case in the history of capitalism, whole nations to go to war with, with each other. They can definitely cause a lot of suffering and destruction. But, what are, but why are they doing it? Is it because they are bad people and more ethically virtuous people would do a better job at running the world? Of course not. Things are not so simple. One of the great benefits of class analysis is that it depersonalizes behavior of concrete individuals. This doesn't mean people are blind robots in service of some higher forces that we cannot comprehend. It does, however, mean that there are objective social relations that determine the actions of each of us in a very important, even in, a cru in, even in crucial aspects. We have already mentioned that capitalism at its core is a profit-driven production system and that this has extremely profound implications for each and every one of us. It means that we are not producing to satisfy social needs but to satisfy capitalist, capital's eternal appetite for surplus labor, for profits. <coughs> this means food is not produced to satisfy concrete hunger of concrete people but is instead produced, just like millions of other commodities, to satisfy the hunger for ever bigger profits. If this means polluting the land, deforestation, destroying of, uh, destruction of primitive communities, extinction of dozens of animal species, and endless other social and natural tragedies, so be it. We are not producing drugs to safeguard our health, but again, pharmaceutical corporations are explicitly devoted to maximizing their profits. Suffice it to say that on a yearly basis, more capital is devoted to the research of drugs against boldness than for research devoted to combating malaria. We could continue listing examples, but in each and every single field of human conduct, profit is the only thing that matters. It is the lifeblood of capitalism. In the first book of Capital, 
Marx cites English economist T.J. Dunning that vividly describes the profit drive. Indeed, it is a drive in Freudian sense that overdetermines capitalist production. Dunning talks about capital as a timid animal that tends to avoid noise and uncertainty. However, he immediately adds, this is only partially true and it all depends on the profit rate. The fact is, capital is sickened by low profits or even no profit at all, as it is, as we already said, its lifeblood. So capital is always on the hunt for ever greater profits. And with the magnitude of the profit rate, it, its behavior dramatically changes. With 10% profit, profit rate, capital becomes self-confident. With 20%, even more so. A 50% profit rate will make capital presumptuous. And with 100 or 300% of profit, profits, there is not a human law capital is not willing to trample, not a crime it is not willing to commit, in a, even if this means its owner may be hanged for it. It is a kind of bestial drive that forces even the owners of capital to subject themselves to its logic. And here we can show that capitalism is first and foremost a social function, a social forum, absolutely necessary as long as capitalism will exist. We can shoot a capitalist, but in doing so we haven't shot the social forum itself. And as long as capitalism exists, someone will take capitalists' place. Even capitalists themselves are not really free. I mean, they are far better off than most of us, but they are ultimately bound to the logic of capital. In comparison with feudal lord that could really enjoy wealth, was basically a rentier who could enjoy material goods more or less regardless of his or her efforts, capitalists must always be on guard. Although he must constantly accumulate capital, he can, he can never really enjoy it as a person. He is forced to immediately throw the accumulated capital in the new cycle of production, guaranteeing even greater accumulation of profit. But why are we as a society accumulating ever greater masses of profit? Well, because we are. Capitalism does not have a rational answer to this question. When question is posed, why, we are, why are we producing profit, capital answers it tautologically, because we will, be, we will be able to accumulate more profit and more and more and more. The idea is to, is to go to profit eternity. However, the, rela the, <clears throat> the reality is much bleaker, as we will show in the section devoted to the problem of crisis. At this point, let us just emphasize that capitalists cannot afford not to invest, not to accumulate, not to realize profits. If he does so, he ceases to be <coughs> capitalist. Either he becomes a rentier or he goes bankrupt. In both cases, he is not a productive member of capitalist society anymore. Productive labor in capitalism is only labor that produces surplus value. But who is producing surplus value? Capitalists? Of course not. It is the majority of us that in trying to guarantee our survival have to sell our labor power in the exchange for a wage. Each day we wake up, work 8, 10, 12 or even more hours to eventually get paid. We are the class of not-haves. The only thing we have and can sell are our hands and minds. We don't own factories, gold mines, laboratories, PR agencies and other means of production. Just in passing, we can mention a so-called creative class of workers that is supposedly liberated from such stiff labor conditions. However, it is just an illusion. Even a so-called creative worker is basically selling his or her labor power. In some crucial aspects, he is even worse off than a, traditionally, than a traditional factory worker. He needs to buy his own equipment, he usually doesn't have any social health or pension benefits. It is important to emphasize that this social forum, the class as such, has some very concrete and inevitable consequences for each of us. For most of us, it means we have to find some means of survival, we need to find a way to sell our labor power. Currently, capitalism is extremely aggressive in its atomization of labor force. Although workers of all kinds and varieties are the majority, the big class of the society, we are so individualized that we have been convinced that our success or our failure is our own merit or fault. If we are a member of a well-off family and manage to sell our labor, for, our labor power in a PR agency, working as a media consultant, we can become a respected member of society and praise for how successful we are. 
If we, on the other hand, live in a ghetto of immigrants and don't have any social connections whatsoever, we are forced to live on the social margins, working in low-paid jobs or in order to guarantee our survival, resort to petty crime. What we are trying to come to is the fact that the life of an individual in capitalism is overwhelmingly predetermined by one's class position. Regardless of one's aspirations, virtues and sins, hers or his class position is the one which fundamentally determines one's life's perspective. A great trick of the system is that it has, especially in the recent decades, with the powerful offensive of neoliberal ideology, managed to convince people that everything is possible. We are we are continuously told, be good, study and work hard, and all good things will come to you. Crisis of capitalism has shown just how big of a farce this ideology was. It has forced men, as it is written in Communist Manifesto, to face with sober senses his real conditions of life and his relations with his kind. Indeed, I believe the most concise definition of capital as such is that it is a social relation. In this way, social space is not empty. It is densely structured with capitalist class relations, which, very pre which predetermine the horizon of our individual lives. We as individuals are actually extremely limited in our actions. It, is, it often seems we are just small cogs inside a huge and powerful machine that is beyond our comprehension. Although it is precisely us that are feeding this machine. Either as a great majority of us through selling of our labor power, or as a minority through the never ending pursuit of and maximization of profit. Such social relations are not specific to one country, a group of countries, or even a continent. Capitalist social relations are a global phenomenon. And this is what we will address in the following section, dealing with the world market. In recent years, Especially in the last decade of the 20th century, so-called concept of globalization became ever more prominent in social sciences and supposedly provided some kind of explanatory force in trying to grasp the dynamics of contemporary world or contemporary capitalism for that matter. It is worth noting that we can save ourselves a lot of time, energy and confusion if we carefully read Communist Manifesto, where Marx and Engels depicted such processes with much more clarity. If they were able to write about globalization almost 200 years ago with such clarity, it is only rational to conclude that, it is, that this is not any new phenomenon, but something that is distinctive of capitalism from its very beginnings. <coughs> Actually, we, we won't find the word globalization in the manifesto, but the term world market, which I believe is a more rigorous concept and can better grasp the global dynamic of capitalism. Let us quote two short quotations from Manifesto on this matter. The bourgeois has, through its exploitation of the world market, given a cosmopolitan character to production and consumption in every country. And a few sentences later on, it compels all nations on pain of extinction to adopt the bourgeois mode of production. It compels them to introduce what it, what it calls civilization in their midst, to become bourgeois themselves. In one, wor in one word, it creates a world after its own image. The world market as such is a world after bourgeois' own image. And here we need to be precise. This means we are dealing with a very specific type of globalization. This is not a globalization of social rights and welfare state. It is not a globalization of social needs and their universal satisfaction. As we, have tried, as we have already tried to show, all of these things appear to be irrational and unnecessary burden from the capital's point of view. On the contrary, it is precisely through minimization of effective and universal satisfaction of social needs that profits can be maximized. This is shown through ever more aggressive privatization of welfare state, where social and health services that used to be freely and universally accessible are now privatized and payable. So instead of using an anti-signifier of globalization, which doesn't tell us much about exactly what kind of globalization are we talking about, it is much more useful and precise to talk about the world market as a concrete expression of globalization in this stage of historical development of mankind. It is also a stance that emphasizes that it is not the only possible globalization, or as the motto of Porto Alegre Forum goes, another world is possible. 
But it is only possible through a rejection and abolishment of this concrete world, world of capitalism. Let us now try to further elaborate what exactly does it mean that the bourgeois is creating the world after its own image. In doing so, we will resort to some concepts that have been developed by Marx, only later on, in his critique of political economy. Looking around the globe, it seems that we are experiencing a great variety of concrete expressions of capitalism. I believe it is crucial to maintain the perspective that all of these have common denominator, that they are all the concrete expressions of the same abstract logic of capital. Karl Marx's analysis of capital includes such a dialectic of concrete and abstract on the most elementary level of capitalist production, that is on the micro level of commodity itself. Every commodity that is produced in capitalism already embodies a duality of abstract and concrete. Before publishing Capital, Marx actually wrote to Engels and emphasized that this dual character of commodity forum, which basically means a dual character of labor in capitalism, is one of his most important discoveries. How is this duality present? On the one hand, each commodity has a concrete dimension. It demands concrete labor and concrete time, and when finished, has a certain use value. On the other hand, all of these characteristics have their abstract dimension as well. Each commodity embodies abstract labor and abstract time, and as such has an exchange value that guarantees it the potentiality to be exchanged for any other commodity. This elementary dialectic of abstract and concrete that is already present on the most basic level of capitalist production is a necessar is ne necessarily makes capitalist production system as the production system, a kind of melting pot where all other production systems have to adapt or perish. And through adapting, they necessarily become capitalists, by their logic. Capitalism can only function if all labor is only indirectly social, which means workers don't have their own means of production, and that they have to conduct their social interaction through the interaction of things that have taken on a social character of their own. Let us, let us resort to a bit longer quotation from the section on the fetishism of commodities from Capital, where Marx describes precisely this problem. I quote, The twofold social character of the labor of the individual appears to him when reflected in his brain only under those forms which are impressed upon that labor in everyday practice by the exchange of products. In this way, the character that his own labor possesses of being socially useful takes the form of the condition that the product must, not, must be not only useful, but useful for others, which is crucial. And the social character that this particular labor has of being the equal of all other particular kinds of labor takes the form that all the physical different articles that are the products of labor have one common quality, that of having value. However, these two fundamental as aspects of capitalism that are already embodied in its most cellular form, that is commodity form, are an irresolvable contradiction. The, the contradiction between abstract labor and exchange value on the one side and concrete labor and use value on the other. This cannot be solved through capitalism, but through its abolishment. Left on its own, this contradiction escalates and explodes in a great systemic crisis of capitalist mode of production, like the one we are experiencing nowadays. Next chapter will be, devote, will be therefore devoted to the issue of crisis, which is another important concept already present in the Communist Manifesto. Since the beginning of the current crisis, various interpretations were given about what exactly caused the crisis. Liberal interpretations have argued that it is a kind of external anomaly a disruption of otherwise normally functioning system. However, we believe that the correct interpretation of the crisis must not focus so much on the specific manifestation of capitalism, not even on a specific period in its historical development. Proper interpretation must, first and foremost, show what in capitalism as such produces the inevitability and cyclical repetition of crisis. In other words, we should we should be interested in the question of if crisis of capitalism occurs in spite of external factors and anomalies and are actually inherently produced by the normal functioning of capitalism. Marx answers 
um, with a categorical yes. As we have already emphasized, capitalism is a system based on a production of profit for profit's own sake. And this basic drive is both tautological as well as teleological, as it has nothing outside its own logic on which it would be based. Of course, the precondition for the realization of profits is the extraction of surplus value, and in accordance with the law of value, labor is the source of all value. In the interest of the class of capitalists is that they enlarge this surplus as much as possible and consequently realize greater profits. However, in this mindless and eternal race for profits, the capitalist is not alone, but is instead always in competition with other capitalists. In gaining advantage over competition, capitalist relies on science and all the talk about the necessity for investing in research and development and introducing innovations basically amounts to increasing productivity of labor. At the end of the day, this means producing more in less time and with less labor power, which is just another euphemism for laying off workers and intensifying the exploitation of the remaining ones. However, all of this is beneficial for an individual capitalist as he gains a comparative advantage over his competitive competitors and can realize higher profits, but not for long. Quickly, the competitors need to adapt themselves and introduce new technologies as well. They have to increase the productivity of labor or risk being put out of business. Yet, it is precisely through this catching up that the beneficial effects innovation had in the first place are annulled. The innovation ceases to be the exception anymore, but becomes a new norm. Be that as it may, what changes is not just the newly nivelized profit rate, but something much more profound that actually characterizes the most basic contradiction of capitalism. What changes is the organic composition of capital. Since innovation <coughs> innovation height, heightens the productivity and less labor power is now needed, this increases the amount of constant capital, which, that is machines or that labor, while it decreases the amount of variable capital, workers or living labor. Since only living labor is capable of creating surplus value, this poses a fundamental problem for capitalism. As Marx emphasized in the third volume of Capital, the profit rate does not fall because labor becomes less productive, but rather because it becomes more productive. This is why capitalism continuously faces the dangers of overaccumulation, or more precisely, overproduction of commodities. That is, commodities that are no longer able to be profitably sold on the market, which basically means the separation between production and consumption, which is just another name for a crisis. On this basis, Marx argued that capitalism is tendentially prone to general crisis, that is, general slump of profit rate through the economy and consequently understood the law of the tendential fall in the profit rate, <coughs> about which we have already heard from Sasha, as the most important law of the political economy. Or as he already wrote in Grundrisse, this is in every res respect the most important law of modern political economy, and the most essential for understanding the most difficult relations. It is the most important law from the historical standpoint. It is a law which, despite its simplicity, has never before been grasped or even less consciously articulated. In practice, the general fall in profitability leads to a market suffocated with commodities that nobody buys, which includes that specific commodity on which the whole production of value relies, labor power. It is because of that, that in crisis we face an acute eruption of unemployment, just as we are now during the debt crisis of the Eurozone crisis of the Eurozone countries. <coughs> in manifesto, we already encounter a vivid description of the crisis we are currently enduring. Marx talks about the absurd epi epidemic of overproduction, something that would be completely unimaginable from the standpoint of earlier epochs. In, no, um, in capitalism, society suffers because it produces too much instead of producing too little. It is as if, another quotation from Communist Manifesto, society suddenly finds itself put back into a state of moment, uh, momentary barbarism. It appears as a famine 
uh, famine, uh, famine uh, a universal war of devastation had cut off the supply of every means of subsistence. Industry and commerce seemed to be destroyed. So what is at stake nowadays? From the perspective of capital, the proper remedy is some kind of barbarity. Massive devaluation of capital, which entails large-scale unemployment, poverty and immiseration of masses, uh, and other policies that have already appeared in the time of Great Depression. At that time, one could actually find shanty towns in the United States, and they were named Hoovervilles after the American president at the time, Herbert Hoover. There were, there were other names derived from this, from president's surname, like Hoover Flag, an empty pocket turned inside out, Hoover Blanket, old newspaper used as blanketing, and Hoover Wagon, an automobile with horses hitched to it because the owner could, not, could no longer afford fuel. This just shows that when capital's survival is at stake, no human price is too costly. Although one won't find Hoover wagons in nowadays America, the immiseration certain communities are enduring, most notably Detroit, is telling. In Europe, Greece is the prime example of how socially devastating capital, or more precisely its proponents, the notorious Troika, won't hesitate to be. With this in mind, it becomes obvious that a strong revival of Marxism is crucial because it provides us with a conceptual apparatus that enables us to rationally grasp the capitalist reality, while also having the revolutionary implications for its abolishment. In the last chapter, we will address exactly these implications. Marxism will be relevant and will not th theoretically exhaust itself so long as capitalism will remain alive. Only when capitalism will be abolished, that is when Marxism will practically exhaust itself, will we be able to speak about its irrelevance. As we already said, its success is the condition of its demise. But since we are still stuck with capitalism, it is of the highest importance to talk about how to translate highly complex and abstract Marxist analysis into concrete political practice. This is a very difficult task, and not everything that presents itself as a genuine alternative to capitalism is a, a real alternative. This is why we are devoting our last chapter to the issue of false and real alternatives to capitalism. Perhaps the most concise definition of false alternatives to capitalism is that they're not pointing towards a post-capitalist society. Either they're fetishizing an older society, for example, feudalism, or they're decontextualizing capitalism, taking only those elements that seem to be positive and trying to build a new society on these fundaments. The problem with all such approaches is that they're not, that they're obscuring the fact that capitalism as a production system is an organic totality. We cannot take just a few bits and pieces that we like. We must take everything or nothing at all. In the last chapter of Manifesto, Marx and Engels are dealing with such false alternatives. They talk about so-called reactionary socialism, which, is the, which does not oppose bourgeois per se, but it just wants to restore the old feudal world. Even nowadays, this kind of criticism, joined with a moral outcry, is not that rare. Especially in traditional, conservative, and religious circles, there is widespread sentiment that we as a society have lost our moral compass, and that a return towards the good old society, where all social relations were clear and permanent, is nowadays necessary. Indeed, bourgeois played the most revolutionary role in trying role in destroying all such traditional feudal religious relations. But this still doesn't mean returning to them is in any way progressive. Far from idealizing such relationships, we need to keep in mind that those were times of rigid patriarchy, women oppression, lack of all kinds of freedoms that have been gained through capitalism, one-sided as they are. So such proposals of a return to good old times that never existed, um, are therefore a false alternative to capitalism. Next in line is conservative or bourgeois socialism. According to Marx, the ranks of such socialists consist of, I quote, philanthropes, humanitarians, improvers of the condition of the working class, organizers of charity, members of society for the prevention of cruelty to animals, etc. Such critics of capitalism and bourgeois society are trying to do away with some very obvious negative aspects of capitalism. For example, hunger in Africa, 
brutality of meat industry, environmental pollution, etc. While not being able or not being willing to understand that these aspects are not some kind of anomaly, but a necessary and inevitable outcome of the never-ending pursuit of greater and greater profits. Through various charity actions, such bourgeois socialists are trying to pacify the proletariat and trying to show that another world is possible inside the already existing world. A concrete example of such actions are Bono of U2, Jeffrey Sachs, and campaigns like Make Poverty History. They're trying to rationally show that some goodwill and effort will do away with all social ills. At the end of the day, such socialism is reactionary and in the service of safeguarding the capitalist mode of production. Therefore, it is a false alternative to capitalism. Last on the list of false alternatives to capitalism is utopic socialism. Problem with such socialism as it historically developed and is persisting up to today is that it is building elaborated recipes, cookbooks for the future society. It is detached from concrete working class struggles and is trying to imagine and develop future society on its behalf. It is mistaken that concrete political problems that need to be articulated and solved through practice itself can be theoretically solved and then just implemented in reality. It seems one of such utopic socialist proposals looming, looming large nowadays is the idea of universal basic income. Without going into too much details and various versions of how such an income would be implemented, some of its cardinal errors are visible from far away. The whole idea of wage workers being able to liberate themselves while still living in a society of wage slavery is contradictory on itself. Universal basic income is an idea of relative radical redistribution of the value society is already producing. But it does not tell anything about the production of value as such. It, <clears throat> it mistakenly believes that such a redistribution is achievable through a reform, while struggles for redistribution of socially produced value are always class struggles. Such an income can seem a rational day, only an, an rational idea, only when it is completely detached from concrete social relations. That is why it again doesn't point beyond capitalism and is a member of the family of false alternatives. But what then is a real alternative to capitalism? Only those that are, the, that are producing this system, whose muscles, brains and nerves this system of capitalist exploitation is using every day, that is workers, have a genuine interest of truly changing the world, of truly fighting for a post-capitalist world. We have hopefully shown that capitalism is an irrational system, which doesn't care about human needs and aggressively subsumes them under the dictate of profit maximization. If such brutality was not obvious before, it has shown itself in full force in the time of crisis. Record high level of unemployment, environmental degradation, collapse of social, health and pension systems, lack of any kind of perspective for younger generation, are not just things we hear in media, but are concrete social facts we are experiencing in our daily lives. Alternative to capitalism is therefore absolutely necessary, that much is clear, we cannot live with this self-destructive system. However, a question we need to pose is, is an alternative possible? And if that is so, on what terms? I believe right now working class is very atomized, extremely exhausted, both physically and intellectually. It lacks any serious self-consciousness. It lacks any serious institutional, ideological or political power. Bottom line is that, that it Workers still exist as a class, objectively speaking. However, they don't perceive themselves as a class, subjectively, which again is strictly conditioned by the already mentioned lack of any ideological or organizational power. I believe this is a sober analysis of the contemporary situation of the working classes all over the world. Generally speaking, working class was forced into continuous defeats and retreats in the last couple of decades after the onslaught of neoliberal policies in the beginning of the 70s. With the crisis, millions of people that used to have some basic trust in this system were forced to look on their living conditions with sober senses. The younger generation was, was suddenly forced to accept the fact that their perspective and quality of life will be much worse than the one their parents have enjoyed. I strongly believe that nowadays, the most urgent task in combating capitalism 
is to build workers' power, to build working class self-consciousness once again. This is an extremely difficult and long-term process, and precisely because of that, it is urgent we devote to it as much time and energy as possible. Since we have already emphasized capital is a system of organic totality, which means either you take all or nothing, a counter project must also be a project of organic totality. It means we need to once again establish all kinds of workers' institutions that once already existed. We need to have workers' theatres, libraries, sport clubs, newspapers, web portals, international cooperation, and so on and so on. Each element of the society we are currently living in has a potential to contribute to building socialist hegemony. It seems a great task in front of us. It's something that was already present in the times of German social democracy of 19th century and was known under the name of merger formula. What does it mean? Merger formula aims at the merger of socialist policies, ideology, intellectuals, if you want, and workers, working class as such, a massive movement it can produce. In, key, in his critique of pure reason, Immanuel Kant wrote that thoughts without content are empty. Intuitions without concepts are blind. And I would be bold enough to formulate this in the following terms. Socialism without workers is empty, and workers without socialism are blind. Only through union, only through a merger, can these two forces provide a higher synthesis that will be able, and already was able, to seriously combat capitalism. <coughs> On such basis, it seems only appropriate to end our lecture with the conclusion of Manifest of the Communist Party. Proletarians of all lands unite.